and welcome to another story. And today we have part nine of Birthday Boy by David Baddiel, continuing from chapter 47. I'm a guinea pig for crying out loud. You know what I wish, said Grandma Poppy. I wish we could ask it how it got here. You wish you could speak guinea pig, said Grandma Glenda. Poppy looked at her. She and Glenda and Mike and Charlie and Vicky and Carmel and DCI Bryant and PC Middleton were all standing on the bank of the river near the road looking down at Spock. He was still nibbling at the manky apple core. Sam had been right. He was a guinea pig who liked to take his time over food. Well, now you've made it sound stupid, said Grandma Poppy. That wish, how typical. To be fair to Poppy, Spock was looking up at her with an in-between munching, quite a strong sense of, I could, of course, tell you where they are, if only you weren't so stupid as to speak gu not, not speak guinea pig. I, of course, understand English. I just don't speak it. I don't think it is stupid, said Vicky. She crouched down and tickled Spock on the forehead. Normally, when anyone did this, he ran away to hide in his cage, but this time he seemed to like it, although possibly he stood there accepting it, as on the riverbank there was no cage and nowhere to hide. Spock, she said, focusing very intently on Spock's eyes, which meant, obviously, that she had to look at him first one side and then the other. Where is Sam? Where is Ruby? Spock looked up at her. Munch, munch, he went. Also, wobble, wobble. A bit in his lower cheeks, like guinea pigs do. Oh dear, whispered DCI Bryant to Peter Middleton. I think the pressure of losing her children may have got to Mrs Green. I think she may be having some sort of breakdown. Sam, Spock, Ruby, where are they? Why would you say that, sir, whispered PC Middleton. DCI Bryant looked at him. Because, Middleton, she's asking a guinea pig where her children are. PC Middleton looked back at him, still whispering. He retorted, I checked the manual, sir. It definitely doesn't say what you said, and it definitely does say that the best people to aid in a search for the missing person are those who knew the per missing person best. Yes. So, what point are you making? Well, DCI Bryant, sir, as far as I understand it, Spock has lived in the same room as Sam Green for the last year. He's been with him throughout the whole period. In fact, when Sam has been having his birthday every day. So, if anyone could be said to know the missing person well, it would be Spock, the guinea pig. That's what you're saying, is it? Yes, sir. DCI Bryant nodded. Then he reached up and put his thumb and finger on the left side of PC Middleton's mouth. What are you doing, sir, if you don't mind me asking, said PC Middleton. DCI Bryant didn't reply. He just very slowly drew his thumb and finger across PC Middleton's mouth while making a zzzzt sound, followed by when his thumb and finger had reached the right side of PC Middleton's mouth, an ip sound. PC Middleton nodded, a little sadly. But actually, as he did so, someone else nodded. Yes, said Vicky. Really? PC Middleton and DCI Bryant looked around. Vicky and now Charlie and Carmel were crouching by Spock, who seemed finally to have finished the manky apple. Grandma's Glenda and Poppy and Grandpa Mike were standing by, looking down. They probably would have crouched too, if, if they could. Go on, Spock. Yes, good boy, they were all saying. DCI Bryant frowned and walked over, as did PC Middleton. When they looked down, they saw that Spock was nodding. He was nodding his head to one side. His considerable snout and little beady eyes were bobbing continually to the left. It was a constant gesture, and it contained more than quite a strong sense of, over there! It said, in fact, as clear as the moon in the sky above them, over there! Or to be precise, over there is where Sam and Ruby are, on that island. What they are doing there, or why they chose to bring me, I have no idea. I'm a guinea pig for crying out loud! Vicky, Charlie, Grandma Poppy, Grandma Glenda, Grandpa Mike, Carmel and DCI Bryant all looked over to the island. After a short while, DCI Bryant became aware that PC Middleton wasn't looking at the island. He turned around to see that the PC was in fact looking at him. He, PC Middleton, had his own finger and thumb pinched on the right side of his mouth. Unzip, said PC Middleton, whilst drawing his finger and thumb over to the left hand side of his mouth. Chapter 48, Stronger Than the North Pole the island, though small, was not easy to walk through, especially when it was this dark, especially when you were an 11-year-old boy and an 8-year-old girl, and very tired and very cold. Even though they had only been going about 20 metres, when Ruby looked around, she could no longer see the water. It felt as if they had come into some deep and dark jungle. She held tight to her brother's hand. He suddenly stopped moving. Can you see the light? said Sam, looking around. The star? No. Either it stopped shining or we've gone the wrong way. OK, he said. I think we need to do something. Go home, said Ruby. No, said Sam. Then he looked at her with a worried face. Do you want to? Yes, obviously I'm eight. I'm in the middle of an island on the river in the middle of the night, she said. But then her face hardened and looked resolute. But not until we find the star. Sam smiled. Thanks, Ruby. 
He was going to hug her for a moment, but then they both realised it would just make her wetter. What thing should we do? She said. Sorry? You said we should do something to locate the light. Oh, yes, look. Sam took something out of his pocket. Ruby looked at it, screwing up her eyes in the darkness. Then it became clear. It was Grandpa Sam's battered old compass, the one that looked as if he must have used it in the First World War, even though he couldn't have done it, as even Grandpa Sam wasn't that old. The compass made Sam remember suddenly what the point of this whole secret journey was. His eyes pricked with tears at the thought. Yes, said Ruby, shaking him from his trance. What about it? She peered down at it. The arrow was pointing to a label on the compass marked North. Well, I just brought it because I thought it would help us find our way. But how does a compass work? Ruby, of course, knew this. It's magnetic. It finds the magnetic field of the Earth. The North Pole is the most powerful magnetic field on the planet, so the arrow points there. OK, but wouldn't a star this close have a magnetic field that overrides the Earth one that would be stronger than the North Pole? In other words, so when the arrow says North, what it would mean if there was a star over there is star over there. Ruby looked at him. Well, yes, but Sam, I I'm really not sure that light is a star. You know what, Ruby? Neither am I. But do you have any better ideas? She looked at him. Then she looked down at the compass, which was pointing very clearly to the right. She looked back at him. No, I don't. And off they moved to the right. Chapter 49. Hello, HQ. They're on that island. I'm sure of it, said Vicky. Now, now, Mrs Green, I really don't think we can be absolutely sure of that, said DCI Bryant. Can you get a police boat, said Charlie, to take us over there? What about a whole fleet, said Grandpa Mike. Yes, said Grandma Poppy. After all, what have they been kidnapped and are being held hostage on that island by, by terrorists? Oh, can we please try and not be silly, said DCI Bryant. Excuse me, said Grandma Glenda, drawing herself up to her not very full height. No one tells my sister-in-law not to be silly. Everyone looked around. There have been a lot of surprising things about the events of this night so far, but this might have been the most surprising of all. Grandma Glenda standing up for Grandma Poppy. And then, to make it even more surprising, Glenda went and stood by Poppy and linked arms with her and Grandpa Mike. Oh, blimey, sighed DCI Bryant. Then Vicky and Charlie went over and joined the line, and so did Carmel. Even Spock came over as well, although that might have been because he'd spotted another manky apple core next to Grandpa Mike's foot. But DCI, Bry wasn't, but DCI Bryant wasn't having any of it. Look, he said, what do you lot expect me to do? From his chest, where it was stuck, there was some Velcro. He ripped off his walkie-talkie radio and held it up into the air. Contact Police HQ and ask them to send out a SWAT team, jet skis, boats, frogmen, the whole lot, on the basis of a tip-off from a guinea pig, really? At which point, PC Middleton grabbed the radio and said, Good idea, sir. Hello, HQ. Did you get all that? Chapter 50. What aliens? As Sam and Ruby walked, tramping over branches and leaves and nettles, the compass became harder to see. It had, however, some kind of luminous tip on the needle, so if Sam held it up to his face, he could make out that it, were, what, that, that it was pointing still in the direction they were going. But it was difficult because here, right in the middle of the island, the trees were denser than ever and the darkness was deeper. It felt as if Sam and Ruby were not just fighting their way through the foliage, but also the dark itself. I can't see anything, said Ruby. Hold on to my hand, said Sam. I am, but what I mean is, I think, Sam, if there was a star, we would have seen something or heard something. Heard? What noise do stars make? I don't know, some kind of space noise, I suppose. And then suddenly, they did hear something. A noise, a high-pitched whine. It rose and fell and rose again. What is that? whispered Ruby, now very, very frightened. She looked to Sam, hoping he was not very, very frightened. Unfortunately, when he whispered back, I don't know, he sounded very, very, very frightened. Let's run away from it, said Ruby, pulling him backwards. No, said Sam, holding his ground but tightening his hold on her hand. Just let's, let's listen for a minute. So they did. In tone, it sounded really spacey and weird, but although the rise and fall had a kind of jauntiness, a jolly, almost tuneful quality, it sounded familiar. Ruby said, that sounds a bit like... Sam put his finger to his lips, shushing her. Then he whispered, yes, but maybe that's a trick. A trick? By the aliens, trying to trick our brains into hearing something nice and recognisable, which lures us into their trap. Lures us into their trap. What trap? We're looking for a star. That's what we've been heading towards the whole time. Now you think it's a trap? And and what, aliens? I don't know, Ruby. I thought we just we would just find a bright magical ball. I, I didn't think we would have a deal to deal with, well, everything. Spock coming with us and falling into the water and the skate boat banging into the rocks and the cold and the wet and the dark and not being able to find our way. And now I think you might be right that it might not be a star, 
Maybe it was never a star. Maybe what I saw fall from the sky was a, was a UFO. Ruby looked at him. The whine, which now did appear to her to sound like an alien voice, grew louder. She didn't know what to think. She was a very rational child and very interested in science. But when it came to stars and aliens, there were lots of stuff, as she'd said herself about black holes, that science still didn't know. However, surely, she thought, it couldn't be a star or a UFO. I mean, she thought, not actually. And suddenly, at that point, she and Sam, in fact, what seemed the whole island, were bathed in light. Chapter 51 very loud and fudding. One of the things about light is you need it to see things, but if it gets really, really bright, light itself is what stops you from seeing. That's called a blinding light, and that's what this light was, white and completely making it impossible to see anything. Ruby and Sam shielded their eyes and looked up, but it seemed to be coming from the sky. Perhaps it was a star after all, or indeed a UFO. It was also suddenly getting really, really windy, but not normal wind. The branches on the trees were bending and the leaves were flying, like, well, like a ship was taking off. The noise had got much, much louder as well, although now it wasn't just the noise of the alien whine. Now it was mixed in with an engine noise. Again, we're very loud and thudding and repetitive. With the wind, there were so many sounds it was impossible to pick out just one to help understand what was going on. Ruby, Ruby put her arms around Sam, terrified, screaming, you're right, it's a UFO, it's aliens. Sam didn't know what to say. He too was terrified, but he was also her big brother. So he held her close and shouted back over all the noise. Don't worry, it's going to be OK. Because that's what people say when they have no idea whether it's going to be <laughs> whether it's going to be or not. Then something appeared in front of the hugging siblings, something which in the blinding light was just about as visible as a ladder. Sam Green, Ruby Green, a very big solemn voice intoned. Get onto the ladder. Step onto the ladder. Chapter 52 a human shape. At this point, Sam, who had watched a lot of science fiction films, thought, oh no, I know how this goes. We climb up the ladder, then the aliens open the silver door in the enormous silver craft. Then we go in and there's a long black empty space that we float up through because there's no gravity. Then we arrive at a part of the ship that is very white and there are some strange medical looking instruments and two operating theatre beds. Then the aliens come in and thank us for helping them with their research. He was about to scream, ah! don't go up the ladder ruby don't go they want to probe us they want to when he noticed something about the big solemn voice don't be frightened it was saying just get on the ladder what he noticed about it was that his mum had called a br it was what his mum called a brummy voice it had a brummy accent that seemed a little odd for an alien Obviously, Birmingham was quite a long way away, but still, in all the science fiction films he'd seen, even when the aliens did speak English, they rarely had local accents. Ruby, he said to Ruby, who he noticed had squeezed her eyes tight shut. Open your eyes. I don't want to, she said. No, I think it's OK. Slowly, she did as she was told, but she still couldn't see because the light was still very, very bright. Look up, said Sam. Ruby particularly didn't want to do that. Up was where the light and the noise and the ladder were coming from. She didn't want to look up because it might hurt her eyes, but also because that's where the frightening aliens and their frightening ship were. Because by now, every even rational scientific Ruby was convinced that what, that's what it was. Ruby, said Sam, honestly, look up. So she did. She put her hand over her eyes and stared into the sky. At first, it looked just like a really, really bright light was up there shining down at her. Maybe it was a star after all. But then a shape moved across the light, a human shape in a human uniform. And the shape shouted, children, it's PC Middleton from the police. You met me at your house. Don't worry. Step onto the ladder. Climb up the ladder and then get onto the helicopter, said Ruby excitedly, finally realising through the noise and the light and the wind what it was. Chapter 53. Don't swear in front of my children. Ruby continued to be excited as she put one foot on the ladder, which it turned out was a rope ladder, and reached out with her hands to pull herself onto it. But then she found she couldn't do that. She couldn't do it because Sam had put a hand on her shoulder. Hold on, he shouted up at the same time. We came here for a reason, and we're not going back until we found out what we're looking for. Er, uh, said Ruby, when you say we there, yes, she sa he said, still holding on to her, we came here to find the star, or whatever it is that I wished on that is making my birthday happen every day. We have to reverse my wish so we can find Grandpa Sam, so we aren't going home until we found it. Yes, again, when you say we there, look, this was DCI Bryant, now also leaning out of the helicopter. PC Middleton, it turned out, was actually flying the helicopter. Get on the ladder, 
Get on the boot! Don't swear in front of my children! This was Vicky, who appeared from behind DCI Bryant. Sam and Ruby looked up. They could see both their parents looking very, very relieved in the back of the helicopter. Sitting with them was Carmel from Abbey Court. And behind her, looking a bit silly, to be honest, in the helmets that everyone was wearing, were Grandpa Mike, Grandma Glenda and Grandma Poppy. Sorry, said DCI Bryant, but come on, we can't hover over this island forever. Yes, besides which, if you don't get on the ladder, DCI Bryant will get into trouble, serious trouble, for requesting a helicopter, shouted PC Middleton. Oh, do shut up, Middleton. Have we given up saying zip it, sir? No, shouted Sam. I want to know what the light is that's coming from the island, and you're not helping me by shining that bright light over all over it. It just means I can't see anything, and that's typical of you too. And then, as loud as his 11-year-old voice could get, so that you could even hear it above all the noise of the helicopter blades, he shouted, You weren't any help in finding Grandpa Sam either! Following which, also in a loud voice, but weirdly with the tinny metallic alien tone they had heard before, they heard someone say, Brackish Mezels! Who said my name? Sam looked around. Ruby looked around. DCI Bryant looked around. PC Middleton looked around. Vicky and Charlie looked around. Carmel looked around. Grandpa Poppy, Grandma Glenda and Grandpa Mike looked around. The helicopter itself seemed to turn to have a look. And standing there, holding Sam's missing for some time voice changer up to his mouth, and in his other hand, Sam's power torch, was Grandpa Sam. Chapter 54. A Camping Trip. Sam and Ruby dropped off the ladder and rushed over to their grandpa. What are you doing here? shouted Sam over the sound of the helicopter blades, still swishing loudly above them. I'm not sure, said Grandpa Sam. I think I... Grandpa, shouted Ruby, stop speaking into the voice changer. The what? The voice changer. Grandpa Sam looked at Sam's voice changer, which for some reason he was holding in his hand, and which explained the strange whiny tone to his voice. Oh, you mean this? It's a megaphone. I need it to ward off the biddly tongs. Banditing biddly tongs. The, the biddly tongs, said Ruby. Sounds just like one of his swear words, whispered Sam to her. The grandpa was continuing. Yes, the enemy. You never know when one of them is going to creep up on you. But you see, if I whistle into this, it changes into a warning. They understand and they keep away. Do they, said Sam, looking around. Can you see them? Sam looked at Ruby. Ruby looked at Sam. Then they both looked at grandpa and shook their heads. Told you, said grandpa. Then he started whistling into the voice changer again. But why are you here at all, asked Sam, on this island? Grandpa frowned. He lowered the voice changer. Yes, that's what I'm finding hard to remember. I think I think I just wanted to get back to nature. It was at this point that, following a sudden movement of the helicopter light, which properly illuminated them, Sam and R Ruby realised that Grandpa was not actually wearing any clothes. He wasn't naked, though. He was covered in leaves and mud. You know, said Grandpa Sam, I I've been spending a lot of time recently indoors. In this strange place, what's it called? Abbey Court? Yes, that's it. And you know, it's fine as far as it goes, but I just wanted to be outdoors. I always loved outdoors. I always loved camping and swimming and just being outdoors. So I thought I'd set off for a camping trip. Right, said Sam. Samuel! Samuel! They looked up. It was Poppy leaning out of the helicopter. Confusingly, she now had a real megaphone. Oh, hello, Poppy, my dear, said Grandpa Sam, waving up to her. Uh, are you trying to ward off the biddly tongs too? What, she said. He's talking about the megaphone, shouted Sam. Now, for some reason, said Grandpa Sam, going back to Sam and Ruby, and ignoring the fact that his wife, who he hadn't seen for a week, was now shouting down at him from seven metres up in a helicopter, I couldn't find all my old camping stuff, so I just put together some bits and pieces uh, as best I could. At this point, he held up the voice changer and the power torch. Can't remember where I found these. Some kind of warehouse or something. Chocker with stuff it was. I think it was my route, Sam began to say. Shh, said Ruby. Let Grandpa finish. Samuel, stop talking to the children. Get them on the ladder and then you get on. I think it would be better if he got on the ladder first and then the children. This was Grandpa Mike, having grabbed the meg megaphone off Poppy. I agree. Grandma Glenda, having grabbed the megaphone off Mike. Oh, do you? You think you know what's best for my husband? Grandma Poppy, now having grabbed the megaphone back again. Yes, you tell him, Poppy, that's my girl. Grandpa Sam on the ground, shaking his fist through the voice changer, which was set. Now, I think this was just an accident to Mickey Mouse's voice. I thought you lot had decided all to agree nicely with each other back at the riverbank when you all stood up to DCI Bryant. This was Charlie, who had taken the megaphone from Poppy and was clearly not going to give it back to any of the grandparents anytime soon. 
they all went quiet, except Grandpa Sam, who said, What blinking boom schmoggling ladder anyway? Chapter 55 Wobbly and windy and swaying and frightening. This one, Grandpa, said Ruby. It had just, in fact, swung over from the police helicopter about five metres to Grandpa Sam's left. It hung in between the three of them, shuddering with the vibrations from the helicopter above. Yes, said Sam, this one. We'll get on first and then you, Grandpa. Ruby started to get on. Then she stopped. Sam, said Ruby. He turned to her. She was at her his eye level. You're okay to go now, even though we haven't found the star. Sam looked at her. He reached out and touched her cheek. He'd never done that before. Grandpa is the star, Ruby. He is? Yes. The light that I kept seeing on the island from my room, it was Grandpa flashing my power torch. He pointed to Grandpa Sam, who was still holding the torch in his hand. Oh, she nodded and reached up to climb the ladder, but still didn't actually go. Is that a bit disappointing? Sam looked over to Grandpa Sam. In the bright light from above, they could see his kind, smiling face. Well, they could see his kind, smiling eyes underneath a lot of mud and leaves. No, said Sam. The main reason I wanted to find the star was to stop my birthday being every day, so that everyone could get on with just finding Grandpa. And now we have. Ruby nodded again. Ruby! shouted Charlie from above. Stop hanging about! Come on! OK, Dad! she shouted up. But she still wasn't going. What about your birthday happening every day, Sam? How are we going to stop it if we can't find the star for you to do a new wish on it? Sam frowned. He didn't know the answer to this. If Grandpa was the star, he could try wishing on Grandpa. But he knew that wouldn't work. I don't know, Ruby, but... Ruby, please! I think we'll just have to think about that later. She nodded for the third time, but this time raised herself upwards and climbed the rungs towards the helicopter. Sam watched as his sister got to the top. He watched as she stretched out her arms, and as Vicky and Charlie stretched out their arms, and then watched their faces look unbelievably full of relief as those arms suddenly became full of her, of his sister. He thought, well, I should go too. That looks nice. And they look, now that they've stopped hugging Ruby, and she's gone to sit in the back of the helicopter with the other grandparents, like they really want me to come. So he started up the ladder. It was more frightening than he'd realised. It made him think how it, were, it must have been very frightening for Ruby. Even though he'd always been a good climber, as we know, he often went up on his own bunk bed at night without even using his hands. This ladder was wobbly. The whole thing was wobbly and windy and swaying and frightening. But he was helped along by his parents and grandparents and Carmel and PC Middleton, who were all going, Come on, Sam, you can do it, Sam. You're doing so well, Sam. Which really did help. He looked up rather than down towards his parents reaching out for him. Only one more rung to go and then he would be there. And then he had a thought. He stopped climbing. He was hanging on the last section of the ladder and looked down. OK, Grandpa, you ready to come up as well? Grandpa Sam looked at him. Then he looked up at the helicopter. Then he looked around at the island and then he said, No, I think I'll stay here for a bit. And that is where we will leave part nine of Birthday Boy by David Baddiel. I'll be back soon with the final part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated, guys. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye bye.